Welcome back, everybody. Hey, welcome back, Doug. Very excited for today. So, well, we're doing something uh, a little bit different from how we normally do. For sure, for sure. You know, without too much fanfare, you know, we have some a special guest, as Doug's mentioning, uh, to uh, introduce. And I just want to say before I introduce him that, you know, this is a first for us doing uh, video that this will be available hopefully for video but certainly audio and it's our first guest ever for Doug and I um, and we couldn't have you know got blessed enough uh, in, in any better way than we are today to have Jackson Pemberton. Now Jackson wrote something that Nelson Nash quoted in the book, Becoming Your Own Banker, on page 31 and 32, Jackson wrote this article in 1976. And I was curious of like, after reading the book several times, I said, who is this guy, Jackson Pemberton? <laughs> like, <laughs> what was he about? You know, because Nelson doesn't, other than quoting some of his writing, he didn't really talk about Jackson. He didn't say anything about him, who he was, where he came from, all that, other than to say where he where he wrote the article that uh, was quoted. And so without further ado, and I'll get into more, I want to introduce everybody to Jackson Pemberton and, and friends and loved ones call him Jack. So Jack, thanks so much for joining us. It's so yes, great. Yes, welcome, Jack. Thank you. I, it's good to be here. I'm glad to glad to be here with you yeah, this morning. So uh, it's been it's been 50 years since all that happened, but uh, I'm still kicking. You are, <laughs> and you're you're kicking well, you know. And that was what was a bit shocking, you know. What I was mentioning this uh, to someone earlier. I said, you know, when Nelson referenced anything you know and of course he was an austrian school of austrian economics uh advocate and uh you know we took all these guys uh von mises and ludwig von mises and all these guys were older right and i said well of course a guy that was writing as if he was one of the founding fathers <laughs> which this uh story uh and how you positioned it I said well he was an old man in 76 and I said you know he's probably not alive I mean honestly mm -hmm. Jack that's what I, I said to myself I, so I looked you up and I'm like holy cow this guy's not only alive <laughs> he's he's got a website he's still writing I'm like what? active blog and yep yep yeah, like I was shocked, right? And of course, on your website, there was a way to reach out to you. And that's how you and I first met. I sent you a note through the website. Yep. And I think the next next morning, you called me. <laughs> and I don't, I didn't answer because I did like Kansas or, or Utah or whatever the number came from. I was like, I don't know, you know, who, the, who this is. And then I was like, wow, okay. So... Exactly. Truck warranty had expired, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So, you know, since you and I have met, like, you didn't know uh, Nelson Nash, right? You, you That's both, right. you both knew Leonard Reed, yeah, I knew. who uh, I know. was president or owner or what have you of uh, the Foundation for Economic Education. Right. which you were commissioned. Is that the right way to put it? I mean, I don't know if you paid or you just, how it happened. I, I'm interested in that story, how that came about that you wrote a series called A New Message. And there was a number of different publishings that you did for right. the bicentennial issues of The Freeman, which was a magazine basically that was published by Fee and Leonard Reed. And That's he right. must have connected with you for whatever reason. I'm kind of interested in that story, and then we can get into more. So, okay, I'm I'm glad to tell that story. It uh, it was a shocking story for me. 
1975, my wife and I were attending a series of lectures by Cleon, W. Cleon Skousen, who was, uh, he worked for Hoover and the FBI for a while, didn't like Hoover, by the way, um, became the uh, police chief in Salt Lake City. And this, this happened in Salt Lake City. We lived in about 20 miles south. We uh, were invited to this series of lectures. Skousen was talking about the founding fathers and the creation of the Constitution. So my wife and I attended those, and I had uh, a lot of thoughts about political things. I thought I understood some of the uh, finesse that many people were missing. So we attended those, and about two-thirds of the way through, I was I was so moved by uh, what I was learning, so amazed at what appeared to be a miracle unfolding at the convention. Uh, I, I'm a religious guy, okay? That's going to be obvious in a second. And what happened to me was probably at least very close to the most spiritual experience I've ever had in my 86 years. Uh, so that night in my prayers, that particular night, I I just said to the Lord that uh, I really appreciated learning all this stuff and I was amazed by it. I would like to help if there's any way I could. I would like to do some writing that nobody knows Jackson Pemberton. Why would they read anything I wrote? Um, I don't know how to break into this. But if I could help, I'd be glad to. Now, years later, I realized that what I did that night was volunteer. <laughs> hmm. And so <clears throat> the Lord took me up on that. One thirty, I woke up writing as though I were one of the founding fathers. And well, that's ultimate name dropping. Uh, but maybe it'll work, you know. I'll, I'll see where that goes. And as I sat there and thought about that, I began to have these thoughts coming to me. And then for the next two hours, it was it was an amazing experience. Somebody, it was like somebody was dictating to me, and I wrote as fast as I could, tears running down my cheeks. And uh, that was the beginning of three articles. And I had to keep this yellow legal pad with me for a few weeks and a pencil because I never knew when that was going to start again. Mm. So much of what I wrote there was, I, I cannot call it my work. I was just a transcriber. Uh, and a lot of it is things that I um, worked with and some of it is indeed my own writing, my own thinking, as far as I can tell. But, you know, with the experience one has with these kinds of things, you never can be totally sure where it's coming from. <laughs> so I hesitate to say any of it was mine. And if my belief that I'm a child of God is, is anywhere near correct, then I can't take credit for very much at all except for volunteering. Mm. To be that conduit, right? To be the conduit of yeah. Yeah. our founding fathers and them talking to us 200 years later, thereabouts, right? That's really yeah. what it was because it was a celebration of the 200 years of yeah. our de declaration of independence. Right. And, um, you know, I, I'll tell you that I... I've read the excerpts on page 31 and 32 of Becoming Your Own Banker several times, but uh -huh. it wasn't until yesterday that I re read that whole particular article. Oh. That, And yeah, I mean, and I took some notes and I was like, how is it? You know, so you're telling us, how is it that he knows this stuff? Like you, what you knew, the way you said it, pretty matter of factly, it wasn't like you were in and out of this sort of 
um, expression of the founding fathers, it really felt like you were a founding father. I mean, that's that's what the writing is, and it's and it's trying to point out. Um, and I'm going to pull up the book if you guys don't mind, because there's one sec part on page 32. Well, I guess it starts on the bottom of 31 when it says, but history like nature travels in cycles, both liberty and oppression contain the seeds of their own destruction. This stuff coming out of you and in through your hand onto the computer or paper, paper, I guess you said. And then it yeah, goes on to say, our success has... Yeah, our success has brought the security which you put to sleep, put you to sleep. Yeah. I'm sorry, I interrupted you there. Oh, that's all right. I was just saying uh, I was writing on a typewriter. Oh, okay. On the typewriter. Uh, 1976, 1975. You know, we're yeah. doing laptops <laughs> Nope. Yeah, it would be it would be something if you told me you didn't even know how to type yet and you started typing. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I could I could do 110 words a minute on a wow yeah wow that's impressive okay mm -hmm. secretary yes <laughs> uh, so I will add one thing that is uh, as I got into that I realized that I needed to uh, in order to be able to speak like a founding father i needed to drown myself in their writing so i spent a lot of time in the federalist papers reading mm -hmm. those studying them understanding what they're saying and of course i kept attending skousen's lectures yeah it's kind of it's like <clears throat> yeah it's kind of like preparing for a movie role like right people submerge themselves in you know, if they're going to be a police officer, they might drive around with a police officer, like live the life and right. embody, yeah. right? So right. you sort of embodied what mm -hmm. was written and you, so you became the real thing you, yeah. you did through that process. Uh, it was almost like an acting job, though you weren't, you know, it was real. It was, it's all real because it's there for us to see today, 50, almost 50 years later. You know, Jack, you and I uh, have only known each other for a few months. We just began talking a few months ago and um, in a couple of different conversations and back and forth. Uh, we've talked about love. In fact, you, you, you might you might want to share. You told me earlier that you had a dream. <laughs> you woke up <laughs> with that word. And I've said that that's really what I think this infinite banking concept is about for I, I certainly think it's the same for Doug and Doug you can speak for yourself but I think it is from my conversations with you is we are loving on people because we're trying to show them there's a little bit less enslavement if you go through this process right you can sort of step outside and you can take responsibility which was ultimately the responsibility was what Nelson was doing in this analogy of your writing was that yeah. we can't just abdicate to our government officials we can't just ab advocate to uh, the bankers and the financial people like hey that's their bailiwick they know what they're doing and you know we so-called hired these representatives and that's their thing. They know what they're doing. They're the experts, right? But no, yeah. we are the ones that give them the power as you've written. Um, and we've, we've lost sight of that. And yes, we do the same in yeah. both realms. So it was a perfect thing that he pulled up from, because he didn't write the book till 2000, <laughs> right? Yeah, 24 years later, and he pulled that part up to make that analogy. Mm -hmm. Right. Right, because that's but, a pretty central theme in the book of, uh, you know, regaining control there. Um, yeah, yeah. 
I like to say it this way. We need to be actors and not acted upon. And that's one of the goals of human life, I think, is to free ourselves from being a victim or being subject to outside forces, but to be in control of our own lives. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just happened to see something while we were trying to get this going this morning, uh, a little article from the Cato Institute about universal savings accounts. And way down in there, it says this, to fix this problem, Congress should create a universal savings account that would function similarly to retirement accounts. Income saved in the account would only be taxed once, but without restriction on who could contribute, on what the funds could be used for, or when they could be spent. Similar accounts have been set up in Canada, United Kingdom, and South Africa, where they are wildly popular, having increased personal savings, and are used by people at every income level. And I think, how totally ironic the government needs to create freedom. It doesn't work that way. They need to create a universal savings account. And they don't need to do that. Why can't we already? I mean, this is a description of freedom. You set up an account, anybody can put money in it. You can take it out anytime you want to. You can use yeah. it when you want. Yeah. And they're saying Congress should create this thing. <laughs> it's we almost are... as though people forgot what happened with Social Security, right? I mean, it's uh, yeah. it's funny. Um, people come up with these plans and these ideas, and what invariably happens is the government will see that as a, a viable place to pull money out of now because they need money. And the rules around that will change as time goes on. And, you know, it's, 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 uh, it's, I agree that is uh, ironic. And we have a much better way of doing things, which I think is, is interesting that um, you've seen that since speaking with John. And I mean, I, I, I just read your latest blog post. Um, I'd love it if you could speak a little bit more about uh, your recent journey into life insurance. Because as I understand it, after speaking with John, you identified so much with this concept and process that you you wanted to go become a, a licensed agent yourself. Is that correct? That's correct. I just got my license uh, about two weeks ago. So you got that done in like less than a month. Yeah, it took about a month. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's great. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Well, I'm so if. If you don't mind me asking, what which about? Jump. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt there, Jack. Oh, that's all right. Go ahead. What about uh, what about the vehicle of whole life insurance and this uh, practice of infinite banking resonated with you so strongly that you felt you wanted to go get a license in that short of a time frame? Oh, uh, you know, my father sold life insurance when I was in high school. Back in the 50s, 1951 to 55 was my high school years. My father sold life insurance. I had a couple of policies on me. I got married and had a family, ran out of money and cashed them in. What a terrible mistake. <laughs> anyway. Not the only one. <laughs> yeah, so I, I'm the world's worst example, but uh, that's a learning experience. And... I think that helped uh, soften up my brain <laughs> and my mind to accept uh, Nash's idea of whole life insurance as a vehicle toward wealth. It just makes a whole lot of sense. And when I when I got the paradigm shift to recognize that whole life insurance should be seen first as a financial vehicle a facilitator and, and an enabler with the additional plus frosting on the cake of a death benefit. We should, mm -hmm. we should call it life insurance. We should call it prosperity insurance <laughs> with, wow. a, with a death benefit. So, yeah. Anyway, that. Hurry up and trademark that, Jack. Yeah. <laughs> yes. 
Yeah. Uh, yeah, I like that. So yeah. I was I was totally ready for that idea. But at my age, I'm struggling to figure out how in the world to use it. <laughs> I don't know what it would yeah. cost me to buy a whole life insurance policy right now. Uh, it might be a little bit expensive. I, I think it might, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but the uh, the interesting thing is, given your propensity for you know uh, passing passing along messages and helping others, it's likely that you could do a good deal of good in in um, you know perpetuating this message to future generations, which would you know obviously be invaluable. Well, yeah, yeah, I've got I've got all the experience I need to say, don't do it the way I did it. <laughs> right. Exactly. And, don't we all? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I, you know, I've spent thousands of dollars on interest over the years. Had a big family. Uh, I've earned over a million dollars. If you add up all my wages, and it's all gone. Mm. It's all interested in those kids, and I don't. I have no re regrets about that. But uh, that's where I am. So I'm substituting teaching to keep myself going. Uh, I have a little bit of pension. I moved around a lot because I was in uh, information technology and I could improve my salary more by moving than by staying with any one company. Mm -hmm. My my 401ks and those kinds of things were minuscule <laughs> compared to what they might have been if I had stayed with somebody. So, uh, but again, I have no regrets. I'm, I'm doing fine. Mm. But it could be improved upon, and that's what you're trying to help people understand, right? Right. Exactly. Yeah. There's a better way. There's a better way, and I, yeah, I know prospects and clients. People became clients. They use the that exact phrase. There's got to be a better way, right? Mm. And then they're like, "Holy cow! Here it is." I just yeah. want to add to, like you said that being an actor as opposed to being acted upon right that we miss that right and it's interesting you're using that language because i you know a few months ago you didn't even know about nelson and his writings and right. of course he he knew about your some of yours but he didn't know about something say in uh 2021 which i took a see if I can find it here. I had it a moment ago and it was under a section in one of your uh, blogs, state rights or sovereign human rights. Um, <clears throat> it says, so we keep asking the federal government to solve more problems and that thus to get bigger and bigger. And it is only too happy to comply <laughs> as bureaucrat <laughs> bureaucrats build their kingdoms and budgets while assuming more and more jurisdiction, which is a key word, as you know. Uh, and then we complain that the government is way too big. And you put, go figure, right? <laughs> and Nelson wrote the same kind of thing in 2000 that you didn't know about. He's talking about, you know, who are you in the play on right. the stage of life? And he says to com further compound the problem, there is this prevailing tendency in the current crop of Americans to look to government solutions to what they think is a problem that is outside themselves. And then you're reading this morning, Cato Institute saying that we should have this universal savings account, which is one more government solution they're asking the government, they're writing this to the government, like you should do this. Yeah. And we already have a vehicle and it's better than the, what at least was described and what you just read, which is because you don't take your money out. You yeah. don't have access to your money. You can leverage your money. So your mm -hmm. money keeps growing. So it's yeah. better than what they're asking to be now created. Yeah. It's existing today. So that's the stuff to me. It's like, does anybody understand whole life? And nobody, I mean, very let's few say, so the, very few. yeah, so few know about the infinite banking concept of how to utilize 
the whole life, uh, the concept of utilizing it to finance yeah. your life and then finance your retirement. That would what you paid in interest and principal and all that stuff with all those children and all the moving around and buying houses and selling, <laughs> you know, all this stuff that you were going to pay that stuff anyways. And if you had paid it back to the insurance company, you'd, you'd still have the million bucks plus all these beautiful children and the great life, right? You didn't have to like trade off. You could have had both. And yeah. an and enormous that's not death benefit. Yours. Plus a death benefit. <laughs> A, so, a substantial one at that point, right? Yeah. Yeah. Great yeah. point. <clears throat> substantial. It yeah, we, we've said this before. A, million. On, we, a lot more than a million. Yeah, we've said this before on here a lot where, I mean, I, I've gone and looked at socialsecurity.gov and I'm only, how old am I going to turn in July? 37. Can't I keep forgetting how old I am? That's not good. But <laughs> I'm I'm Me about too, to Doug. turn 37, and and even at this point in my life, I've looked at you know the amount of money that I've earned versus how much I I I retain right in my banking system, and it's 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 depressing. Um, and luckily I found this I found this way of doing things now that allows me to retain a much larger percentage of that, so I I have the ability to kind of start over, which is great. But even when we, John and I show this to people and we show them this better way and people can acknowledge that it's a better way, there's still so much resistance to it because people just assume that there's got to be some catch that we're not telling them or, you know, because everybody else isn't doing it, it must not be the right thing to do. And I'm sure that you run into that ideology quite a bit as well. It's, it's easier to be a sheep. It truly is. It's yeah. a lot easier to be a sheep and just kind of go along with the herd. And it's tough yeah. to break through on that to people. Yeah. And, and it requires a, a mental shift. You know, that's that's one of the big challenges. It's a paradigm problem. You know, we grow up in a, in a society that looks at things. You, you have to use the bank, right? You got to go to the bank to buy a car. And that's that's just we we grew up with that, and we think that's the way the world is. But most of it is, but that doesn't make it the best. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it doesn't make it yeah. the only way, right? For sure. Um, I wanted to go back to this love uh, thing because I'm all about. Well, I'm not all about it, but I, I like love. <laughs> I, <laughs> I like, like to give it, and I, I like to receive it. Um, I love you. Love. Wrote. <laughs> What's that? I love love. Yeah, I love love. That should be uh, on a t-shirt or something. <laughs> uh, you wrote, love is the highest choice. Freedom of choice is the highest right. And the highest choice is to love. And to me, that is so powerful. And then you coined a... It's funny that we talk about leveraging the cash value in a policy... And you came up with a new word, as far as I'm concerned, leverage. <laughs> There's, <laughs> leverage. And I'm like, wow, does that fit perfectly with infinite banking and in what we're yeah. trying to do with people uh, is guide them out of the stress, right? Hey, you, you, you had a relationship with God, which I'm sure was crucial uh, and, and instrumental in keeping your marriage together to raising children to all the the stresses of life right all the stresses at work you know and yeah. that's a, a bunch of what we can't alleviate all the stress uh, all the bad stress but we we know financial is a huge portion of it right yeah. and stresses on our relationships and that's uh, what we're doing is we're trying to release that so there's less concern about the financial because you're not losing sleep over what's in uh, the blind investments that many people make, right? Yeah. They just want to get a rate of return and somebody told them that they can get an average of whatever over a period of time. And it, but it's, it's a lot of hoping right? Yeah. I hope this works out, right? And we're trying to take some of that 
know or some of the hope out in the knowing in put the knowing in right mm -hmm. i'm sure you have no idea how timely your comments are <laughs> I, just just I, yesterday yesterday afternoon my wife and i are camped at a little lake about an hour and a half from here in our little campus And we're talking about we're going to do the rest of the years of our lives. We have decided to sell the house, go on the road and visit all of our progeny. And there's about 60 of them. Uh, and we found a little property in southern Utah, way up in the mountains with a cabin on it that needs some, needs some repair. Really good price. So as soon as I get off here, I'm going to submit a, an offer on that place. And uh, we'll go on the road for a year or two and use that little cabin as a getaway in the summer and fix it up, double its value, and uh, probably sell it in three or four years and buy a condo and uh, get off the lawnmower and those kinds of things. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so I'm, I am totally stressed out today. I'm looking at my finances. I'm looking, you know, everything is an upheaval. But that's fine. It's good stress. We're we're reevaluating. We're thinking all this stuff through, um, and what's driving it is love. Mm. That's great. I just love that. I love that you endured uh, and, and endured the love in the ups and downs of a relationship. How long have you been married, Jackson? Well, it's you and your wife. So it'll be 49 Same. plus 24. Okay. okay. So that you guys talk through the stuff that you know wasn't always easy to talk about, right? Finances are not people's favorite subject, like especially oh, if you're that, stressed about it, right? That's right. It can be really tough. Yeah. Yeah. Most of us avoid it, actually. True. I would say. And, and that's unfortunate because it, it doesn't get better when you avoid it. <laughs> no, it, it's, it, it's, you know, yeah, I think it comes back to, like you said, it's, it's, it's love in, in your relationship with your creator, right? That, you know, you're asking, you're asking him to dwell in you, right? And just like you asked him that night, at that presentation and said, if I can help, let me know how. Yeah. yeah. And you got, you got an answer. And you know from reading Becoming Your Own Banker that Nelson was a Christian, that yeah. he, when he ran into his financial trouble, yeah. he got down on his knees yeah. and meditated, prayed, whatever you want to call it, with, with God. Yeah. And God spoke to him too. Yeah. And, and that's why you and I connected. Otherwise, we would never probably ever connect, right? We both that's go on with our lives and never connect. Yeah. And it was because of the relationship with God for both, both of us, right? For for all for all of us. Yeah. Uh, without it, without leaning on God and asking for guidance, asking for help, ask or, or asking. What can I do? Not even asking for help. If you, if it be your will, do it. You know, I'm, I'm here. I'm your servant, right? I'm, I'll do whatever you want me to do, and that's it. it you know, I, I bounce all over the. Yeah. Go ahead. I have a Sorry. couple of uh, love that I'd like to share. I woke up this morning thinking about uh, you mentioned that, and uh, I would, I would actually started thinking about poor President Trump and how he's vilified and all that stuff and i can't help but admire his uh capacity to endure <laughs> you know yeah. uh, i've never have really liked the man as a man uh he can be arrogant he can be flippant and several other things but then on the other yeah, yeah. yeah. and then i think maybe that's the only kind of personality who could survive this this storm that he's in and I thought if I could if I could get Trump's ear, I would say you need to start talking about, about love. 
teach, teach, lead this nation with love and teach us to love each other. That's the biggest problem I think we've got in many ways is uh, we're learning how to hate one another. And uh, I think it would, it would drive the, the elites crazy. They, they would just, they would hate him all the more because they don't like love. They, yeah. And it comes out, you know, it's once in a while you hear a statement that really reveals where they're coming from. And it's not a not a position of loving the common man. It's, it's a loathing, it's a, what's the word, not a despicable, uh, what, did, what did Hillary call us? The basket of deplorables. Oh, yeah. <laughs> deplorable, we're deplorable. Well, yeah, what are your think, employers, by the way, Hillary? What are your employers? Yeah. This yeah. basket of deplorables. Yeah. Yeah. So if you if you hate somebody who's preaching love, that means that it's frustrating you somehow. And the source of your frustration must be that you don't like love. So if you don't like love, then maybe you like hate. And... Uh, you know, I, I think that's a revealing thought. I agree. I agree. I mean, because how can you... How could you ever get anybody to come to your side if you actually admitted that? Like if you said, oh, that's a bunch of bunk, that love stuff, right? Like that's yeah, crazy talk, yeah. you know? Uh, would not everybody would know, know immediately that uh, you're not the one that we should follow, right? Right, because everybody knows that when they feel love and yeah. feel that energy that's exchanged in, even just in nature, just walking around and seeing yeah. birds fly by you and whatever, right? Yeah. You know, there's there's something physical, right. you know physiologically that changes with your body and it it's an incredible great feeling if you can't describe it but you know when you're in it right I, and that I, feels a whole lot better than hate when you're hating on something or someone yeah. right like that feels like poison right yeah it feels like that. yeah yeah and i i think when when you know that somebody loves you that is maybe the most fundamental uh, compliment. Uh, I, th I just think it's a huge benefit to the self-esteem. And so we have a lot of people who are suffering from lack of self-esteem. And they're, they're uh, we call them, they're in the uh, homeless, they're in the depraved, deprived poverty cycles and uh if, if they just knew somebody loved them what it would do for those people um yeah so i'm i'm amazed that none of the politicians are using the word love you never hear it in a political context so why is mm -hmm. that for or is it forbidden or are they just ignoring it i don't know but it seems to me if you wanted to run for office, you might preach love a little bit. And you might just get a bunch of votes. <laughs> and we're oh, dying. We're actually... dying. What's that? We're, I say we're dying for lack of love. This is yeah. dying for lack of love. That's that's only one perspective. There's several perspectives, of course, but that, that is one of the more fundamental ones, I think. Well, if you, if you take away this tool of fear that's used quite often, which is certainly, if not one and the same. It's a, a close relative to hate, right, is, is yeah. fear. Um, and, and so if, if you believe that that's the way to manipulate things is through some even subtle forms of fear, right? That don't present themselves like in bold letters in front of you, fear, but 
so much of our decision making is based off of fear of something in the future, fear yeah. of something happening if we don't comply. Um, and so we just kind of surrender. We throw our hands up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, you know, first of all, uh, this has been great. I, I hope we can do more of this because this conversation has a long way to go. <laughs> and, yeah, <we're> <laughs> but I do want you to get that property and we'll, you know, we'll stop it roughly here. And, uh, and yeah, if you're up for it, we'd like to do this again and, you know, sometime in the near future and continue the conversation. Okay. That would be great. That would be fun. Yeah. Thank I you very much for your time today, Jackson. Uh, I'm delighted to be here. I hope I've done more good than damage. Absolutely, <laughs> you have. Yeah. It's all and you got to let us know how the, uh, the offer on the house goes, okay? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Hopefully you'll sleep better tonight. Yes. I think I will. We'll get this behind us. and It's, a, it's an exciting time. And we're, yeah. We are very adventurous, my wife and I. And I love uh, it. that's part of the secret of our longevity in our marriage is life is an adventure. Mm. We try to keep it that way. No matter what happens, it's exciting. Love it. <laughs> that is so good. Thank you so much, Jack. All right. We'll talk again. And have the great rest of the day, both of you, Doug and Jack. And That's good yeah, to meet thanks you, again. Thanks, John. Yeah, nice to meet you too. Nice to meet you, Jack. Bye, everybody. Okay. Bye-bye. Okay. So long.